everyone for joining us. There are people who have already started joining. And since we are one hour earlier into our uh, Friday CME every week that's being held on uh, first Friday of the uh, month. And today uh, we have uh, with us a uh, speaker of repute uh, who will be talking uh, something very, very close to his heart and mind, both uh, biology as well as psychology about it. And uh, uh, we have other people who are on board in the form of uh, our CME chairperson who is G. Prasad Rao. Uh, we have uh, chairpersons uh, uh, who are of uh, national repute, Dr. Sheshi Ray, and we have uh, Dr. Maladev from uh, uh, Maharashtra joining us as well. And as I said, uh, there is something which is very close to Dr. Baskar's heart, that is cognitive symptoms and neuroprogression based purely on biology of brain. Uh, that will be discussed by him today. And uh, it is a proud privilege uh, to introduce my uh, the moderator of the program. Normally, this program is being uh, hosted by Dr. Rukshida Saida, who is the secretary of IABP. But today, the responsibility has been given to me in the capacity of Joint Secretary and uh, member of uh, uh, the CME committee. And with me is my big brother, G. Prasad Rao, sir. He has many feathers in his cap. And uh, uh, especially for the today's program, he is the chairperson of uh, CME committee of IABP. He is the president of uh, uh, Giratic Mental Health. He is the president of uh, Asian Congress of uh, Psychiatry. And it is over to Dr. Prasad Rao, sir, uh, to take the deliberations forward and welcome the faculty for the day and uh, uh, take it further. Uh, thank you, Abdul Majid. I know that you are for, thank you for the kind words. And as usual, you are our joint uh, secretary of Indian Association of Biological Psychiatry and the future secretary general of Indian Association of Biological Psychiatry. We all have young leaders of biological psychiatry here. And uh, may I take this uh, privileged moment to first introduce Dr. Shashi Rai. Dr. Shashi Rai, I know her for more than two decades now. She has been the young leader and uh, she has been in the helms of affairs practicing psychiatrists at Lucknow and also in the neighboring uh, city. I would say it's about a hundred kilometers where she developed but more importantly, she is also the president of uh, Richmond Fellowship at Lucknow. She runs a very good uh, rehabilitation center. She has a leadership qualities and uh, quite leader though. And uh, her words are usually valued quite much. Then I take the privilege to introduce Dr. Malay Dawe. Malay Dawe, again with him, I have a long association. And as I see, I'm now seeing the new young breed of uh, leaders of psychiatry. And Malay, uh, I would say he's a pure biological psychiatrist in his approach. His primary interest seems to be in one, on the molecular biology, and second, on the neurocircuitry. And uh, he has talked to us in the recent past too. And Malay is known for, again, his very, very effective way of communication. I love his lectures because uh, he might present only six slides, but the delineation of the slides, he has his own unique way. So without much ado, and I wouldn't like to stand between the large audience, and it is my honor to invite the founder, uh, I would say the FMG and founder president, uh, Mohandas has always been our mentor. In fact, I would uh, tell the, all the audience that Mohan Das is the only psychiatrist from our country who is honored as the world, by the World Federation of Biological Psychiatry as the international mentor. And that's what his, and of course, Mohan, welcome. And I welcome all the members today. Now, without much ado, I would now hand over the mic to uh, my two chairpersons, Dr. Shashi Rai and Dr. Malai Dawe. Uh, thank you, Prasad Rao, sir. A very good evening to all seniors and dear friends. It's a privilege to be a part of this IABP uh, CAB series. And I thank the office bearers of IABP for having given me this privilege. As all of you are aware, it's the topic is cognitive symptoms and neuroprogression. 
I used to think I'm, I was a totally a psycholo more of a psychological person, but seeing, hearing the webinars for the last one week, I think it's better to be, I mean, things are going more, more towards the biological aspect. Neuroprogression is basically the changes that occur in the central nervous system following various mental disorders. Basically, it is the pathological rewiring of the brain. And there is a process of structural aberration, which results because of reduced neurogenesis, neural uh, plasticity, and could be because of apoptosis. And it is said that neuroprogression occurs in almost all mental disorders. And the key to, uh, I mean, the main finding is that it should be, we should intervene early, as early as possible to prevent neuroprogression so that recovery or remission is better. We'll be hearing this from our learned speaker. And uh, having said this, I request Dr. Malay to introduce Dr. Bhaskar. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, IABP, for uh, giving me this opportunity to chair uh, Dr. Bhaskar's session. Uh, Good evening, Dr. Mohandas, sir. Uh, uh, what do I say about Dr. Bhaskar? Well, first of all, the few basic things. He is a consultant psychiatrist, has a busy practice in Kolkata. He also goes uh, uh, every month for uh, a weekend in Kashmir. He goes uh, and he's, he's on the faculty at Malda Medical College. Now, apart from his work, uh, he is... Uh, According to me, the go-to person, whenever there is uh, anything that needs you? to be understood, to be debated, nice to be implemented when it comes to the neurosciences vis-a-vis -vis psychiatry. Uh, I'm, I'm a very uh, vocal person, uh, a very, uh, I would say, a staunch uh, torch bearer of uh, neurosciences in psychiatry. Uh, today, uh, uh, just just to give Bhaskar a perspective, today is uh, Dr. Sigmund's for able to birthday, hear me now? Sixth May, sixth May, so and we have a perfect me. antithesis to Dr. Freud, and uh, I would say so his, uh, uh, so called nemesis of the twenty first century, uh, Dr. Bhaskar Mukherjee. A very interesting topic, as uh, Madam has uh, said. We are uh, looking forward to him speak. And I'm oh, sure uh, oh, the after the coming. lecture, we'll be well informed. We'll be able to have a debate with him on uh, cognitive development and neurodegeneration over the lifespan. And so without much delay, uh, uh, we'll hand over the proceedings to Dr. Bhaskar Mukherjee. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks, boss, for the good <laughs> brief introduction. I don't like interactions of mine because I don't think I am a person who is very keen on hearing his phrases. <clears throat> In fact, that's actually something that makes me afraid or irritated or whatever. Anyway, so today we are going to talk about something that is core of psychiatry, yet the most ill understood and most ignored. Because the thing is, if we list three words that is that are most abused in psychiatry, then first would be neuroscience, second would be neuroplasticity, and third would be neuroprogression. They are most abused and most mysterious word in psychiatry. And in a way, neuroprogression contains other. So with this introduction, let's go to the topic and let's try to understand. I would try to simplify things because if I talk about neuroprogression and what it is and what it is not, then Seriously, we would need a 40 day CME rather than 40 minutes because neuroprogression is everything that is happening in the brain. But I don't have 40 days, I only have 40 minutes, so I would try to make it brief. And when we are talking about these things, please forget. There is an entity called DSM, there is an entity called ICD. Because DSM and ICD 
doesn't have any relationship with brain. They are just some sociopolitical documents. So, neuroprogression in psychiatric symptomology, a transdiagnostic understanding of cognitive symptom in psychiatry. I have written cognitive symptom, but I do not talk about cognitive symptoms much. We have to just understand that neuroprogression would always present past as cognitive symptom. So, whenever we are talking about neuroprogression, the first symptom that we notice would be cognitive symptom. With this, let's go to our plan of discussion today. We will discuss on what is neuroprogression. Along with that, we will talk about is progression unique to brain? Then how much role of neuroprogression is there in psychiatry? Then the pathophysiological basis of neuroprogression in brain and I, although I would like to simplify this, but this would be a purely molecular genetics talk, that part. Then we would discuss that how that is the neuroprogression is reflected in current psychiatric nosology. And then we would touch upon the medicines to prevent neuroprogression. So what is neuroprogression? Neuroprogression is actually an umbrella term. Neuroprogression in itself has no meaning. It is an umbrella term consisting of the following process which start at this end and end at this end but all of these goes on together. First there will be misdirected innate neural development. While developing in the mother's womb, the brain development process is hampered. That can hamper due to various reasons. Number one, the inherent genetic vulnerabilities or inherent mutations. Number two, the somatic mutations or de novo mutations while the brain is developing. Number three, there is some infection while in the womb and that causes activation of human endogenous retroviral component and caused an immune dysfunction as well as some infection which has damaged the uh, growing neurons and things like that. Everything that affects the brain development when the brain is developing inside womb could create this misdirected innate in, uh, neural development. Then, when that happened, brain would try to adapt those two things. We can call that brain tries to cut itself to suit the disability. And that would result in various maladaptive neural adaptation. Let's say the frontal lobe is developing in a immature manner. So what would brain do? Brain would try to increase negative feedback in reward circuit and various other circuits which are controlled and suppressed by frontal lobe. So that frontal lobe doesn't have to take a huge load because it is already immature, it is already damaged. And this neuroadaptation is actually going to give rise various behavioral adaptation and ultimately would change the brain's expression. Now, any damage of brain, any maldevelopment of brain is not static. It is always going on because ultimately these are genetic phenomena. So, progressively each and each new batches of neuronal cells are born with these problems, these genetic problems. They go to miswire, go on and doing miswiring, mismigration, and ultimately formation of various deviant circuits, which 
would give rise to more and more destabilization in brain. This would cause extreme cellular activity and hyper excitation in brain because the brain cells has to take a huge burden due to functional restriction as well as abundant connection. And this would cause hyperactivity of innate immune system and this innate immune system hyperactivity would cause cell death due to immune mediated cellular excitability. And ultimately, there would be neurodegeneration due to all of these treatments combined, and along with specific genetic vulnerability towards developing neuronal apoptosis. And ultimately, our disease would start in the womb and at a various pace fast slowly then rapidly would progress towards total involvement of brain total degeneration of brain and ultimately our neurodegenerative process would come when the person is ill uh, my voice is not clear i have seen a chat that yeah very in the clear. chat box it is there that voice there is voice is not clear but uh, it's clear here. Okay. This is a schematic expression. These are various things that causes changes of vulnerability. There would be unbalanced inflammatory response and ultimately accelerated aging, which would again cause various changes in vulnerability profile. This can be seen better in this picture. This is a normal brain development. But this is where there is dysfunctional microglia, which would cause release of inhibitory cytokines and ultimately the brain, developing brain would go into slow disorganization and then there will be priming of microglia due to various environmental insult as well as various other things like body injury insult. And there will be emergence of disease symptoms in puberty or adulthood. And there will be various other things that would lead to ultimately degeneration in adult or aged CMS. These are the ways things progress. Neuroprogression from birth to death. Biological or clinical findings starting from the midlife or earlier to death. Staging would, of disease process would come fairly late in the process and ultimately it would go till the end. These are various biological findings but these are just early things. I will talk about them later. So is neuroprogression unique to brain? No, it is not. Every disease process progress and it is scientifically expected and normal. Let's say liver. Liver is the organ which I often give as a corollary example to brain because Probably talk that we have 10 billion neurons. Actually, the number is slightly more, but liver has 15 billion photosets. Uh, liver and brain both have multiple functions. So, liver is a good product to brain in terms of biological function. Now, live in any disease of liver that progresses to be it immune, be it autoimmune. Let's take infection, uh, hepatitis infection as a disease exam. If there is hepatitis C and hepatitis B, the inflammation persists and hepatocytes try to rearrange themselves, reorganize themselves, and resynthesize themselves to make work 
in spite of the infection. This results in various form of chronic activity. Ultimately, cirrhosis emerges. And if this thing goes on for long, and along with that, if there is multiple genetic vulnerability, then this same cirrhosis and inflammation combination might give rise to hepatocellular carcinoma. The same thing would happen if instead of hepatitis virus, there is chronic hepatitis steatosis. The steatosis would give rise to inflammation and that, that sterile inflammation would ultimately progress to cirrhosis and cellular death. Ultimately, the person might die from the non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So, this all body disease The destructive and the regenerative Dr. Bhaskar, your voice is breaking very frequently. Uh, oh, at present, you have to remind me because the thing is, I am in Malda today, so the connection is a bit disturbed. Okay. So, relevance of neuroprogression in psychiatry. This is a very famous picture. This is a picture of break staging of Parkinson's disease. In break staging, it is shown that first alpha synucleopathy starts in peripheral and ent enteric nervous system, then in medulla oblongata, then in pontine tegmentum, then basal, mid, and forebrain, as well as hypothalamus and thalamus, then mesocortex, then allocortex, and finally neocortex. And this is the way alpha synuclein travels from gut to central nervous system. That is the hallmark of BRAC system, BRAC staging system. And this is one of the examples of in psychiatry. Although his hypothesis that some external element is necessary for alpha synucleopathy and peripheral entic nervous system are fast involved because they are fast exposed is now under sufficient scrutiny and is probably not true. The peripheral nervous system is involved because the nerves in those areas are mostly less myelinated and more susceptible to hypoxia. So warranty and damage is more seen in there, but still, this is one of the examples of neuroprogression successfully depicted in our brain literature. The back staging is also applied in Alzheimer's dementia, depending on number of plaques, where the plaques are found and other things. In bipolar, nowadays, we are successfully trying to apply neuroprogression and this is the full picture of bipolar disorder taking neuroprogression. First, there is origin which would be principal impact, then cellular function will be uh, uh, in Geopathy, then there will be specific component and then cellular dysfunction. Ultimately, the dysfunctional symptoms would occur. And these are the various dysfunctional symptoms. So, in psychiatry, we are in neuroprogression, but we are still not very concrete in our understanding. In depression, Symptom two, there is some talk about neuroprogression, although this schematic understanding of today leaves a lot to imagination and hypothesis. When we would go into pathophysiology, we would see that this is not so vague. Similarly, 
in psychosis we have come up with this understanding of neuroprogression where due to various factors in womb there is vulnerability which would then progress depending on various adult factor and adolescent factor then ultimately in adult stage there will be various manifestations but again in criticism to this they don't yet consider the endogenous retroviral activ uh, activation or they don't yet consider they don't yet consider that how this type of psychosis progression is no different from progression of mania or they don't yet comment about final progression to various frontotemporal lobar degeneration syndrome so pathophysiological basis of neuroprogression this would be a talk in molecular neuroscience how how much people dislike that i am sorry but molecule without molecular neuroscience we can not discuss about pathophysiology so this is a very simple understanding whenever our brain faces increased homeostatic load or which would be translated in the term of high information carrying load there this in turn causes hyperactivity of the whole brain this is where the first problem arises this causes increased cellular protein recycling there would be also increased mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation and mitochondrial protein misfolding response as well as mitochondrial hyperactivity mitochondrial membrane destabilization permeability of mitochondrial membrane is also changed and there will be ultimately redox stress and cellular stress now cellular stress would be sensed by nlrp not like receptor and rig like receptor and various other pattern recognition receptor and there will be resultant activity of dmp pathway this increased cellular protein recycling would also produce unfolded protein response in endoplasmic reticulum and there will be er stress there will be unfolded protein response which would be active, causing er activation there will be lysosomal degradation of various cytoplasmic reticular material and ultimately there will be aging the there the unfolded proteins as well as the degradation degraded protein if their balance is not maintained there would be heat shock response ultimately there would be chaperon mediated activation the cellular stress sensing pathway and ultimately there would be chromosome remodeling and cellular stress response this also causes change in igf1 receptor insulin like growth factor 1 receptor and its pathway there will be nutritional limitation of cell and there will be further change in unfolded protein response would also causes mitochondrial dysfunction and there will be changes in golgi body and ultimately the whole cell being zero this is how they are related and all these are various pathways causing neuroprogression of disease be it oxidative states be it unfolded protein stress or be it genotoxic stress now i talked about not like this now not like and they are important in autophagy signal transduction as well as transcription activation and inflammation formation 
inflammation formation is the main factor by which they amplify the dmp response this is the dmp response the damage associated molecular pattern is nothing but a group of activate cell via toll like receptor 2 toll like receptor 4 cd44 it cell surface receptor and various pattern recognition receptor in general and after that there is inflammatory cascade by activate cell neutrophil mast cell natural killer cell and eosinophil of immune system and epithelial cell endothelial cell and fibroblast of non immune system and adaptive immune cell t cell and b cell are also involved in damp response this is a cell undergoing damp response and activation i am not going into details of it because that would be more and complex molecular biology and today i am not talking molecular biology i am just giving some idea and understanding this is how inflammation causes amplification of inflammation inflammation and how that causes ultimately activation of resting microglia to active microglia now this microglial activation would cause neurovascular coupling and other thing this is how the microglia is activated normally this is resting state the common classical activation is pro inflammatory so it causes inflammation as well as it causes destruction of various cellular component as well as activation of various neural regulator cell pro inflammatory response is a thing like both pro uh, protective factor as well as destructive factor when it increases cell population when it increases cell maturation it is working for the benefit of organism and when it is causing over excitation of both then it is causing destruction if there is alternative activation then it becomes m2 form which is restorative microglia i am not going into m2 today these are various receptor which causes microglial activation again not going into this so when there is microglial activation there will be modifications of extracellular matrix and limited dissolution of perineural net which would cause restoration of synaptogenesis and there would be also microglial activation associated neural proliferation zone activation neural progenitor and stem cell activation and and those neural cells now settle in the zone of activity as interconnection adaptation this is the first there is neuronal stem cell which are activated by t cell and macrogial cell to produce various form of immature neuron and mature neuron they many a time replace the dead neuron on going to form into new connection but if there is excessive stimulation of this area then there would be injury and then synaptogenesis would lead to synaptic remodeling and various other things. this is how synapses fast neuronal cell are migration and then how various synapses are remodeled either microglia is causing increased survival or it is destroying or it is causing tuning or it is causing formation of long term potentiation or long term repression in long term potentiation synapses are stable 
and all of these are part of neuronal adaptation to various pathological process that is happening in brain and ultimately they give rise to neuroprotection. I have given very schematic view and very rapid view because again we are in a time constraint. So how do you expected in psychiatric one is there's a lot of disturbance. Uh, Yeah, yes. now it's okay. Hmm. So, how is all this process reflected in parapsychiatric neurology? We have already discussed that there is some early understanding of neuroprogression in depression, neuroprogression in psychosis, neuroprogression in Dr. Bhaskar, we are so unable to hear you. Yes, can you hear now? Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yes. Yes, now we can hear. Hmm. We have to understand. Uh, Basko, that, can you use uh, headphones or something so that that background noise will. Yes, I, I, I am trying to find a headphone. Okay. Uh, we have to understand that whenever we are talking about psychiatric, psychiatric diseases and disorders, other things, the, there is no psychiatric disorder per se. In psychiatry, we are still very far from understanding the line between pathology and physiology. We also don't understand that all the psychiatric things that we, are, that we diagnose are not separate diseases. They are just separate symptoms linked by common pathophysiology, common genetic origin, and just a few alteration in the whole pathophysiological process gives rise to various phenotypical form. So the genetics of depression, the genetics of psychosis, the genetics of mania, the genetics of obsession, the genetics of compulsion, they are all interrelated and mostly same. They involve various genes of whole body and only slight variation of combination. So standing there, unless we address this issue, we cannot understand neuroprogression. For neuro, we have to, for understanding neuroprogression, we have to first understand that someone who has today presented to us with depression syndrome, would someday show neuroprogression and go into manic symptom. In a few years, that same person would show more neuroprogression and go into psychosis. And down the line over a few decades, that, that same person would show neuroprogressive sign of neuroregeneration and ultimately would present to us with frontotemporal uh, front lower degeneration. That is how neuroprogression actually happens and that is how our presence really are. We see cross-sectionally and diagnose cross-sectionally. That has to change for us to give any meaning to neuroprogression. Otherwise, we would debate whether depression progresses or not, whether mania progresses or not, and we would waste our valuable time and patient's valuable life because ultimately it is the pain which is affected by neuroprogression, not psychiatric entity. What are the medicines that can be used to modulate neuroprogression? The medicines would be actually any and every psychotropic and many non-psychotropic drugs. Yes, we, you are uh, getting 
astonished by every psychotropic. Yes, to use that psychotropic for specific purpose, you can use every psychotropic we use today for neuroprogression modulation. Let's say antidepressants. They reduce cerebral inflammation. They increase new cell generation in brain. They causes microstructural change in brain. So they are a good step to stop neuroprogression or to modulate neuroprogression. Now, lithium does everything that antidepressant does. For valproate, again, valproate or any antiepileptic, through their various epigenetic action, these drugs changes cerebral microstructure and can be used to change neuroprogression if we understand how and where they should be employed. That is the reason, that is the area where we still are deficient in knowledge, which drug to apply here. Anyway, for antipsychotic, yes, they have also have some role by pro slowing, pro uh, repeated neural excitation in psychosis or mania. They are stopping the excitatory and they are giving the brain more chance to rejuvenate itself and rewire itself. So, for additional purpose, when we you are uh, uh, not hearing you at all. Dr. Bhaskar, there's no voice coming. I think there's a network okay. issue on this side. Yeah. There, there is a problem in network issue, just a minute. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Okay. So antidepressants changes all brain parameter. Simulants increase the prefrontal cortex function and also increases the dorsal attention and These three are our main brain against cognitive symptoms and Transdiagnostic cognitive symptoms means today, if a person comes with us with so called negative symptom of schizophrenia, the first drug to be given to that person would be antidepressant, not low dose amisulpiride or cariprazine or various drugs that pharmaceuticals promote. Then there comes lithium and then comes stimulant. Then we can use other psychotropics. For non-psychotropics, there are actually, there is actually a two-day CME can be done. But for today's purpose, I would limit myself to DP, dipeptidyl peptidase, dipeptidyl peptidase inhibitor 4, means cetagliptin, vitagliptin, and various other things, and glucagon-like peptide 1 agonist or GLP-1 agonist or incatomimetics, means Oscar, uh, you are not visible, not audible. I think you've lost him. 
voice is breaking and uh, very difficult to hear yeah now now is not there i think we have lost his connectivity start this message Sir, Dr. Mohandas, sir, till we uh, get back, Dr. Bhaskar, would you like to throw some light on the topic? You see, uh, Bhaskar has tried um, uh, the way that uh, he wants to express it. I feel this is a primer on um, the basics of neurosciences. And um, I think uh, I have written in my comments, we have to have some workshop to explain what is LTP and LTD. Yes, sir. And uh, uh, he has uh, put out um, the micro, uh, he has just suggested microglial activation, etc., the cytokines. He takes so much time to explain everything. But basic understanding is basically the developmental genes influence uh, the, the neuronal system and uh, that will disrupt uh, uh, the neuronal connectivity that produces a mild connectivity or misfiring that uh, uh, de depending upon the age uh, and depending upon the influence of gene and environmental stressors it get in, in incited it's almost like um, uh, what you call a short circuit in the electrical system almost like that and that can produce symptomatology. It depends upon the type of circuits that we are doing it, which connectivity, et cetera. And um, uh, the advances really say, we can get some leads on this. Many of the neuroscience journal, molecular genetics journal, because Bhaskar only can talk about uh, molecular genetics as a basics now, because people should know the basics. And um, he is a wonderful person. He's connected, Very sir. Good. He's come back again. Okay. Okay. Thank I you so to, much, sir. Uh, I have so to much, go sir. back. I have to go. Thank you, okay. sir. Bye -bye, sir. Uh, all the best. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Oof. As I am in Malda today, the connections are playing very well. How much I have proceeded in last session? No, you can you can continue from wherever you have left. I think you have still okay. got some time left. Uh, uh, I think about five me, minutes. Give me the right to share my screen. I think you have it. Uh, no, no. As I re logged in, gotcha. I am not okay. I, I think we'll have to ask the organizers. Yes. Yeah. Dive take this inhibitors. Right. I was there. Uh, screen sharing, please. Turn on the screen sharing, please. Can we uh, give Vasco the screen sharing again, please? He is logged in again. Okay, no okay. problem. I have just one side left. Okay. So Fine. I can just continue verbally. The thing okay. is, DPP is DPP4 inhibitors or glucagon like agonists. Both of these drugs, they have wonderful action on various microstructural aspects in brain. They modulate the IGF-1 like okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. they modulate the various secondary pathway and ultimately reduces cerebral inflammation. They also causes change in various brain activation pattern and ultimately they are one of the upcoming drugs to change in to change various brain neuroprogressive condition and ultimately they are proving themselves to be a good drug in cognitive symptoms more when we talk about them later, but this would be the gist of their use.
and with this i am ending my session sorry for that disturbance uh, thank you bhaskar uh, madam thank you dr bhaskar it was a very interesting session only thing is we lost you at times because of the yeah. connectivity, uh, connectivity oh, issues so to start the question answer session i would like to one uh, ask you one question that you said yeah. that uh, we see patients cross sectionally and we diagnose mm -hmm. But mm. if we don't do that, then how will we proceed? We have to start in fast contact itself. We have to start from the birth history, the pregnancy history, the infancy development, the early childhood development, and we would see how the brain is forming. There are ample evidences. in each stages of life that this person is going through a wrong trajectory ultimately this is a wrong trajectory what other non communicable diseases of body has advantage in is all the natural histories are known in our cases we don't know the natural history we don't know that our patients presenting to us Expression, which is just brain expression of fever, would come next week. Means today the symptom is depression. Tomorrow the symptom might be manic patients. Third day the symptom might be psychosis. So the symptoms changes, but the background disease and its progression and its natural development remains. And we have to understand that. we have to stop find trying to find the natural evolution of fever because fever doesn't actually have any natural evolution we don't need to uh, focus on individual symptoms we need to focus on the total that is how we can see longitudinally and we have to see longitudinally okay we have a question uh, this is by dr sukrita sharma Uh, she asks, uh, "What is your take on our ritual of classifying psychiatric disorders broadly into neurodevelopmental and neurodegenerative disorders? Aren't really these two the question. same? Aren't these two the same, or at least one converging into another?" Uh, neuro development and neurodegenerative differences is scientifically invalid because. the same processes which causes neuro developmental abnormality means abnormalities in developmental brain now same things makes the brain vulnerable to degeneration and ultimately development and degeneration are say faces to opposite faces of same coin if a brain is developmentally vulnerable then it is going to degenerate early there is no exception to the rule either degeneration will be fast or slow depending on various genetic factor various disconnection factor various <laughs> communication factor but ultimately there would be increased degeneration if there is quality development so standing there this our habit of classifying this has to change we have to change a lot actually to say our habit of thinking and invoking dsm icd has to go our habit of seeing patients transsexual uh, transsexually has to go but we don't know how much we would be able to proceed because people are registered with changes that is another question is there yeah Uh, Priyanka's question: How does stimulants help in delaying neuroprogression? When to start and when to start? Stimulants, we call them as stimulant, but in, in uh, actually these are drugs which primarily act on hypothalamic area, primarily act on prefrontal area, and primarily show their effects in this region. But they have a wider use beyond that these are also like anti depressants increases neuronal cell production 
increases various developmental part but with an age that they have a chance to destabilize the intermediary process too so stimulants by virtue of this action can and does cause delaying of neuroprogression and in case of cognitive symptom these are the drugs which affects the brain based when to start and in whom to start this is a question very loaded question because by now we have understand we have rudimentary understanding that attention deficit disorder doesn't exist it is a attention deficit state sometimes the attention deficit state comes because the brain is processing things too fast and gets tired sometimes the attention deficit state comes because the brain cannot handle too much pressure the sometimes the attention deficit state comes because the brain is reducing uh, brain is losing its capacity to work fast sometimes the attention deficit state comes because the brain is having too much miswiring all of these four pathophysiological process can give rise to single expression attention deficit state and all of these four processes are present since but except the brain is losing the functional capability that would come as slight later but again that is variable so they are present things part but can we treat the baby with stimulant since but the parents would kill us would kill us and would be legally punished so we have to wait till society allows us or we have to wait till the law gives us right to prescribe stimulants at 6 years of age which literally has no meaning at this moment from scientific perspective and in whom to start i would request malay to give his uh, as a chairperson of course his own observation on this current topic uh, the and in whom to give the who would be those ones who are showing attention deficit trait but not all four types would be affected equally those who have reduced brain function and reduced capacity to perform would be benefited most Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Rao sir. Um, see, on this uh, issue of stimulants delaying neuroprogression, first of all, uh, when uh, uh, conventionally, when are we going to use it? Of course, uh, ADHD. If you follow the guidelines, it would be not lesser than five years of age or maybe four years of age. But uh, as Bhaskar said, that this we look at a cross section. We give a cross sectional diagnosis. uh it it's not that there is no adhd before 3 years of age or 2 years of age it's always there so the, it gets manifested differently as the child grows older um uh, now having said that uh, stimulants are not at least in my practice i do not limit them only to adhd in children they can be used for many number of disorders where inattention comes out as one of the core traits so it could be inattention what what i tell students is that when we are looking for example at many individuals who have got substance use disorders we learn we have learned in child psychiatry that a substantial number of children who have got adhd and if they are not treated well they will have as they grow older uh, one is conduct an aspd traits second is they would also have Uh, emotional dysregulation and third is substance use disorders now when somebody comes to me with substance use disorders whatever it is whether it's alcohol whether it is something else i need to look back and figure out whether this is the trajectory that this person has evolved over time now as vaskar said that we need to spend some time 
uh, with the patients to figure out what their histories are. We might give a DSM diagnosis or an ICD diagnosis or an ABC diagnostic system diagnosis. That's one thing. But unless we look at how this thing has evolved in this person, we will not be able to decide. Now, for example, if there are inattention as a trait in any of these individuals, then along with their standard treatment, it is better advisable. And I do add a stimulant. It could be methylphenidate, it could be atomoxetine. If we will have new ones, yes. And it makes a lot of difference in the outcomes. When we look at patients who come with uh, only depressive symptoms and they tell us that I am stressed because of this, because of work, fine. We look at it, we try and give a diagnosis. But why is this happening? Whether there is a primary inattention in this individual right from the word go. And that is causing this person not to really focus, not to finish tasks, not to do things that are achievable and he is lacking behind in his progress, yes. And that is where maybe a stimulant in addition to uh, an antidepressant will work. When we are looking at the older age diagnosis of dementia, many of these individuals will come with a lot of apathy, a lot of uh, amotivation, a lot of dullness, and we would not know what to do about it. There are some reports that inattention also starts de novo in an older age group not related to an ADHD, uh, which has developed early. In such cases, if we are able to identify stimulants can be used. So what I'm trying to say is that our traditional diagnosis kind of bind us to using certain drugs. We are not able to understand. We are not able to explore the whole gamut of activities or actions that a particular drug has, whether it is only for symptom, whether it is something that is happening in addition to the symptoms. Now, when Priyanka asks about delaying neuroprogression, the question is, how long would I give something to see that there is a good effect on neuroprogression? Is it only symptomatic improvement or is it something more? Whether the whole process stops, we have no idea about that because by some guidelines, we might say that, okay, we'll treat this individual for so many months, so many years, and that's the end of it. So uh, we need to look at, uh, as Dr. Mohandas has said that, Bhaskar's topic today is a kind of a primer. I mean, this primer is, it's, it's a kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's like we are seeing the menu of a buffet. There are so many things involved. There are so many tasty and entertaining and interesting things involved. And each of them is by itself a study uh, worth its time. So uh, unless and until we look at all these things, we'll not be able to understand drugs. This is, uh, we are looking at neuro progression. Now, as, as, as uh, she has as, as been said in, by Bhaskar in his talk, there are so many components. So my question to Bhaskar would be something on similar lines. Uh, let's say I am dealing with somebody who has got a bipolar disorder and he or she is around 40, 45. And the bipolar uh, diagnosis was given, let's say 15 years back. So this individual has a longitudinal history of 15 years. What is the role of let's say an agent like liraglutide, what stage I would maybe think of giving it, whether it is only related to the metabolic profile and the metabolic issues that an individual has. So Bhaskar, what, what is your take on something like this? Oh God. Mm, that connection. Yeah. So, oh. so yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Please repeat your question. Please. Yeah. So my question is like something like stimulants. Uh, for example, I have a patient who has got bipolar disorder. He, he or she is around 45 years of age, already 15 years, 16 years down the line. First time when the diagnosis was received. Uh, when you talk of drugs like liraglutide, in an individual mm. like this, what is the correct time where you would introduce something like this? Would it only depend on the metabolic profile or the metabolic issues or difficulties that an individual has? Or at a certain point where you would say that, okay, clinically now I'm able to decide that, okay, this is the tipping point wherein now some other set of events are going to happen. So how, how would you decide on something like this? Stimulants, we, we, uh, we, uh, we are used to using it, but liraglutide is something which is uh, technically strictly a physician's domain or an endocrinologist domain and things like that. So how, how would you go about something like this? 
Okay, the thing is, this has two answer. One is legally correct answer, and the second one is scientifically correct answer. Let's first give the legally correct answer. The legally correct answer is we are going to add liraglutide or semaglutide. Ideally, semaglutide because semaglutide is oral and it is available in India. Uh, when there is fast sign of metabolic disturbance, because that way nobody would raise a finger towards us. But this is not scientifically correct answer. This is scientifically incorrect answer. Ideally, we should add the uh, semaglutide or liraglutide as soon as the patient can afford it and we can write it. Because if we are going to try to modify the trajectory of disease development as early as better, would that change the trajectory uh, by adding liraglutide or semaglutide or cetacliptin or vildagliptin to a bipolar patient who is walking through my clinic first time, that might or might not. We don't have any proof. Why? Because we lack real-time navigation, real-time monitoring of brain. By monitoring brain real-time, we would be able to eventually answer this. Just, yes, I added this drug to this patient regime, and this brain activity changed and stayed changed till the drug exists in system. We don't have that. We don't have anything that shows us this at this moment. So at this moment, it is all a complicated guesswork because not all patients has disturbance in insulin-like uh, factor one pathway in brain. Not all patients has mTOR-dependent neurodegeneration or not all patients has notch hyperactivity where GLP-1 agonists should work. But as their disease progress, there would be a point where these uh, pathways would also be involved in progression. So there would be some effect. Would that be enough to stop the progress to modify their progress, to give patients some extra days of life or extra days of disease-free life? Probably yes, but how much and how to measure that? We don't have any idea as of yet. Dr. Bhaskar, there's just one more question. Uh, yes. Please, uh, from Dr. Devika Patil, that yes. please help us understand the mechanism of switch to hypomania and mania. That is mentioned mm -hmm. when a person is treated with higher doses of antidepressant. What we are mm -hmm. aware is it is because of excessive serotonergic surge. How does it correlate in terms of circuitry? Yes, the thing is, first we have to understand. Uh, actually, this is to be understood from first molecular science point of view, then circuitry points of view. Antidepressants are drugs which are low level stimulants of brain. Initially, they increase brain's activity. And then it is a sustained slow increase of brain activity. Now, whenever we increase brain's activity, we are increasing the inflammatory processes in brain. The inflammatory processes in brain are the processes which also causes brain to grow, brain cells to divide, brain cells to mature, brain cells to form synapses, brain cells to form various connections with blood vessels, brain cells to develop myelin C. All of these functions are done by immune system. But again, immune system activation, if left unchecked, can cause hyperstimulation of brain cell, increase excited toxicity of brain cell, and ultimately excitation wave of brain cell. This excitation wave is 
actually seen by us as mania. Excitation wave first involves brain circuitry in the form of activation of central autonomic grid. This is a grid that connects various part of brain with deep brain stem nuclei and this is the grid which controls autonomic activity in body. So be it any cause activation of the central autonomic grid, there would be ultimately high, hypertension, tachypnea, anger, irritability, restlessness, increased vigilance, less sleep, talkative, more talkativeness and ultimately a feature known as multiple through multiple terms emerge. Some call it paroxysmal sympathetic hyperactivity and associate it with brain injury. Some call it akathasia and associated with antipsychotic drug administration. Some call it treatment emergent affective switch and associated with antidepressant drug use. So it is not always antidepressants which cause it. It is not always drug induced. It is many a times spontaneous. The association with antidepressant is debatable and many a time association rather than causation. But by going through everything, we can say anything that causes activation mm -hmm. of central autonomic grid could produce symptoms like hypermanic. And antidepressants in, those, in some vulnerable people has capability to do that. Whether they would do it or not, that is something we are not able to say at this stage. Thank you, Dr. Bhaskar. It has been a great learning experience. Dr. Malay would like to add anything. Otherwise, you can hand over the session to uh, sir, yes. Dr. Prasadra, yes. sir. Yes, sir. I would agree with you, Dr. Rai. It's been very interesting, uh, very interesting interaction with uh, Dr. Bhaskar. Uh, I think we can hand over the proceedings to uh, Dr. Rai. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. I think Dr. Prasadra had to go for another session. So as the, uh, I would like to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the Indian Association for Biological Psychiatry. Uh, I'd like to especially thank uh, erudite speaker, Dr. Bhaskar Mukherjee uh, for his excellent presentation. Uh, to our chairpersons, Dr. Shashirai and Dr. Maladeve for uh, guiding us through this uh, presentation and uh, uh, for chairing uh, the session today. Uh, I'd like to especially thank uh, President and Secretary, Dr. UC Garg and Dr. Rukshedra, respectively, uh, who have been ensuring that this uh, Friday CME series, first Friday CME series of IADP have been going on on a regular basis. Uh, very importantly, a special thanks to the moderator, Dr. G. Prasad Rao, and who's also the uh, CME, uh, chairperson of the CME committee for this series and uh, also thank you to Dr. Abdul Majid, the joint secretary uh, of the CME committee and thanks to our hosts uh, for uh, this program today. Uh, I hope it was an enjoyable session and we look forward to welcoming you all for the uh, next first Friday series which will be in the first week of June uh, of 2022. Uh, with this, I thank you all for participation today. Thank you very much and good night. Thanks, Bhaskar. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Bhaskar. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. Madam Malay and uh, Dr. Nathan Gupta, sir. Thank you, Bhaskar, as well. Akanshka, you can stop it and you can stop recording. And uh, good evening, everybody, and good night, everyone. We'll see you again okay, next, 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 next month on Friday with a new uh, topic and new speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you and good night. Good night.